Americans, I'm going to even suggest all Americans walk around with a false narrative of who we are, of what this country is. It's what we were taught in school. It is a narrative of greatness. It is a narrative of achievement. But it is false because it is incomplete. On January 6th, that incomplete story about who this country really belongs to turned into a deadly assault on our democracy. Thousands of insurrectionists, activated by a story of existential loss of something exclusively theirs, stormed the Capitol to take their country back. It's our country we want it back! But where does the story of who belongs and who decides come from? In what ways do the stories we tell and don't tell undermine the stability of our multiracial democracy? Since the narrow survival of our democracy in 2021, we've been asking those questions at Sundance through the story of us. This big conversation has become more urgent as attacks on our history, knowledge, and experience have only intensified. This assault on our stories is not new. It is part of the history of American cinema and its own history of erasure. From the Civil War revisionism in Birth of a Nation, the romanticism of slavery in Gone with the Wind, the celebration of manifest destiny in our Westerns, the jingoism of war, to the Hays Codes and the 50s era blacklisting that punished the storytellers who pushed us to widen the aperture to a fuller story of who we are. From Cinema's Dawn, Black storytellers have used the genre to offer a more expansive, honest, and sometimes sobering portrayal of the nation. But this tradition is directly threatened by book bans. Today, nearly half of American school children are subject to laws limiting what they can learn, think, and feel about our past. Many beloved movies, from cult classics to critically acclaimed projects, draw inspiration from books and authors that are now banned. This is not a drill. We've seen this movie before, and we know how this plot ends. The time to craft a different ending is now. Our freedom to live in a fully realized multiracial democracy depends on our freedom to learn the full story of who we are where we have come from, and where we are going. To tell the story of us, we must free our storytellers. We must free our books. Pat Mitchell is an award-winning journalist and producer who has been a Sundance trustee since 1995, serving as chair of the board for more than a decade. Last night, she received the Sundance Institute's Vanguard Award for Philanthropy. She has always been a champion of inclusion, a dangerous woman, and she was a commissioner for this conversation, The Story of Us. Please welcome Pat Mitchell to the stage. Thank you, thank you. I hope you're feeling as privileged as I feel at this very moment to be in this room, to hear this conversation. And I can predict, I think with some authority of spending 30 years at Sundance Film Festivals, that this will be one of the events, one of the times that will be the most transformative of your experience here. Yes, we come to the mountain to see the films, to meet the filmmakers, to hear the stories, to meet people with the new ideas, to make the connections. And tonight will be all of that and so much more. When Bob Redford created the Sundance Film Festival, it was really to make the connection between the stories that were being told and not being seen 
of the stories that weren't getting told because the filmmakers didn't have support or a community to make the connection here in person in this place. And I've been doing that all day today, and I've seen some of you at many of the other events, and we all, we all know now this film festival is so much more than a film festival. And when our country changed so dramatically for so many on January 6th, and the story of us became a different story, and there were so many dimensions to what we needed to understand that had happened and it led to that moment. I did ask Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who I, again, had admired so long and so deeply and who had joined me on the board of the Sundance Institute, if she would convene a conversation and help us begin to understand what had occurred. And that was, for me and so many others who were in that room, the most memorable, the most important moment of that Sundance Film Festival. And tonight, we have invited her with great gratitude to convene that conversation again. Let us be reminded that before there is a final solution, there must be a first solution, a second one, even a third. The move toward a final solution is not a jump. It takes one step, then another, then another. Something perhaps like this. One, construct an internal enemy as both focus and diversion. Two, isolate and demonize that enemy by unleashing and protecting the utterance of overt and coded name-calling and verbal abuse. Employ ad hominem attacks as legitimate charges against that enemy. Three, enlist and create sources and distributors of information who are willing to reinforce the demonizing process because it is profitable, because it grants power, and because it works. Four, palisade all art forms, monitor, discredit, or expel those that challenge or destabilize processes of demonization and deification. Five, subvert and malign all representatives of and sympathizers with this constructed enemy. Six, Solicit, from among the enemy, collaborators who agree with and can sanitize the dispossession process. Seven, pathologize the enemy in scholarly and popular mediums. Recycle, for example, scientific racism and the myths of racial superiority in order to naturalize the pathology. Eight, criminalize the enemy. Then, prepare budget for and rationalize the building of holding arenas for the enemy, especially its males and absolutely its children. Nine, reward mindlessness and apathy with monumentalized entertainments and with little pleasures, tiny seductions, a few minutes on television, a few lines in the press, a little pseudo-success, the illusion of power and influence, a little fun, a little style, a little consequence. 10. Maintain at all costs. Silence. Racism may wear a dress, buy a new pair of boots, but neither it nor its succubus twin, fascism, is new or can make anything new. It can only reproduce the environment that supports its own health. Fear, denial, and an atmosphere in which its victims have lost the will to fight. The forces interested in fascist solutions to national problems are not to be found in one political party or another, or in one or another wing of any single political party. Democrats have no unsullied history of egalitarianism, nor are liberals free of domination agendas. Republicans may have housed abolitionists and white supremacists. Conservative, moderate, liberal, right, left, hard left, far right, religious, secular, socialist, 
We must not be blindsided by these Pepsi, Cola, Coca-Cola labels because the genius of fascism is that any political structure can become a suitable home. Fascism talks ideology, but it is really just marketing for power. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw is a pioneering scholar and writer on civil rights, critical race theory, black feminist legal theory, and race, racism, and the law. She is a professor at Columbia and UCLA, the co-founder of the African American Policy Forum, and the author of Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women. Please welcome our moderator for the evening, Kimberly Crenshaw, to the stage. Welcome to Surviving the War on Woke, Black Storytelling in the Age of Backlash. Thank you, Gina Loring, for that magnificent reading of Toni Morrison's Warning. Toni wrote those words in 1996, almost 30 years ago. It feels like it could have been written today, right? We are seeing accelerating book bans, the censorship of knowledge, the demonization of outside groups and their knowledge about their own histories, and even the emergence of congressional committees threatening to root out subversive ideas that a minority of Americans deem unacceptable. We begin with Toni Morrison because of the shocking fact that she is one of the most celebrated authors of the 20th century, and now one of the most banned authors in the country. Not only was she prophetic, but she was able to tell us what this crisis means and what the stakes are for our democracy. Whether through her speeches or her novels, she is telling us about the nature of demonization and giving us a prism from which to understand it. So we at the African American Policy Forum have been talking about this crisis, this attack on critical storytelling for years. But in this, our fourth iteration of the story of us at the Sundance Film Festival, We want to evolve this conversation. We want you not only to know what is being erased, but we want you to experience it. We want you to feel it. We know we need to feel something in order to fight. So tonight, art, intellect, and activism will be joined in a liberatory dance with amazing artists and thinkers who will bring their incredible insights and their talent to join us in this evolution. Throughout the course of the evening, we'll be joined by many talented actors and performers, including Anjadu Ellis Taylor. Academy Award nominated actor who opens today in the lead role as Isabel Wilkerson in Ava DuVernay's Origins based on based on Wilkerson's Pulitzer Prize winning book Cast the Origins of Our Discontents so go check it out we're also happy check it out (laughs) check it out as soon as the party's over. Go check it out. Uh, Kelvin Harrison Jr. is a BAFTA. (laughs) BAFTA BAFTA-nominated actor known for Chevalier and Waves. He plays Dr. King in National Geographic's new series, Genius, MLK slash (laughs) X. Gina Loring is a poet, vocalist, scholar, activist, and teaching artist. 
She has served as the poet in residence at UC Berkeley Law School, and we are proud that she is our artist in residence at the African American Policy Forum. Aaron Pierre, starring as Malcolm X in MLKX, is an award-winning actor who is best known for his work on Barry Jenkins' The Underground Railroad and in the new film Rebel Ridge on Netflix. <laughs> Dominique Thorne. Dominique is an acclaimed actress who has starred in films like Black Panther Wakanda Forever and Judas and the Black Messiah. And she will star in a new Marvel series, Ironheart. And last but certainly not least, Vanessa Estelle Williams. A producer and NAACP Image Award-winning actress known for her role in the Showtime series Soul Food and films such as New Jack City and Candyman. All right, let's get ready to get connected, empowered, educated, and riled up. Okay, so... What's the war on woke? What's it got to do with books? And why do cinematic storytellers need to care? First, the war on woke is to silence what can be said, what stories we are allowed to know, whose histories may be shared. The war on woke is quite simply an effort to erase the very possibility of an inclusive story of us. It is suppression, and it is happening everywhere and to all minoritized communities. But in the last year, we've seen that the threat of anti-blackness is an accelerant for the entire enterprise. Now, if you think that this is an exaggeration, just consider a fraction of what we've seen so far. The stories of Ruby Bridges, who integrated New Orleans school systems at six years old and went to school all year alone. The story of Rosa Parks. Both of those stories have been whitewashed or banned altogether to make, as the, as the banners say, white children feel comfortable. African-American studies courses have been rewritten to excise the theories and the issues that define contemporary African-American life. And now some entire disciplines have been erased from the academy. African-American studies, sociology, gender studies. Dark money has been marshaled to overturn affirmative action and to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion in various sectors in society. Dictionaries and encyclopedias were taken off the shelves in Florida school districts because the truth is now being labeled as indoctrination. Demagogues crowed that they had scalped the first black woman president at Harvard University. Legislation was introduced just last week in Florida in attempts to make it illegal to denounce racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Now, we can see the impact of these efforts when the story of us is distorted. In the absence of our own voices, the absurd notion that slavery was a personal benefit to our ancestors gains traction. So, now, as troubling as this is for authors and, and academics and school children, why should cinematic storytellers be worried about any of this? As we can see from all the books that are currently banned, censorship threatens not only the narrative pipelines that ground independent storytelling, but it also threatens what films actually get made. And that's not all that's lost. Ultimately, what is at stake is our understanding of who we are as a people. 
The danger of this cultural incineration should be alarming enough, but the consequences extend through the generations. Certain stories and ideas do not get produced. Actors and creators associated with those ideas don't get higher. Oppressive regional standards are nationalized and even globalized. History reminds us of some of the great artists whose stars were dimmed because Hollywood bowed to the demands of part of the country. Harry Belafonte, Paul Robeson, Lena Horne, Nat King Cole, Nina Simone, just to name a few. The same parts of this country that edited Dorothy Dandridge out of movies want to edit Ruby Bridges out of their kids' textbooks. And this is not ancient history we're talking about. Ruby Bridges is still alive. So surviving the war on rope means surviving fear. And right now, fear is legislated, which means part of the fear is running through the law. So when we succumb to that fear, other worlds, other possibilities, other futures, fall to the wayside of history. So our fight is to recover. Our fight is to reclaim. Our fight is to hold those possibilities that can transform our reality. And those possibilities live in books. They live in stories that have changed our lives. And our work is to remember how critical and seminal they are to our own evolution. I'd like to introduce the panelists tonight who will be diving into this conversation to give us insights on how all of this impacts cinematic storytellers. Reggie Rock Bythewood is an award-winning writer, director, and executive producer of the series Genius MLKX, <laughs> premiering on February 1st which he executive produced via his company, Undisputed Cinema. He's also known for his work as the showrunner of the Apple TV show, Swagger. I, I, I made the mistake of saying, I'm just going to watch a couple episodes. What was it, two days later? I watched the whole thing in one sitting. You need to go and do it yourselves. Please welcome also Valerie Complex. She is an associate editor and film writer at Deadline. Her writing has graced the bylines of Variety and The Hollywood Reporter, among other reporting outlets. Janelle English is the founder of Elizabeth, a publishing and consulting company. She's also the former executive vice president of impact and inclusion at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And lastly, Patrick Gaspard is a board member of Sundance, the president and chief executive officer at the Center for American Progress, former president of the Open Society Foundations and former U.S. ambassador to South Africa under the Obama administration. Please welcome all of my guests. Now, as always, throughout this event, we want to hear from you. Please share your thoughts by tweeting us at AA Policy Forum. You can expand the conversation across social media by following AAPF on Twitter and Facebook and using the hashtag Story of Us. So, in response to the rising book bans and the College Board censoring of Black Studies scholars and concepts, we produced a video that outlines why we should be taking this crisis so seriously. Reading, writing, and literacy are pillars of the human experience. The idea that people are trying to ban books enrages me. When I was in the ninth grade, I was transformed by reading Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. When I was 13 years old, I read The Color Purple by Alice Walker, and the experience changed me forever. Heavy by T.S.A. Lehman. It's a book that's being targeted for removal in this unprecedented wave of book bans that we're seeing happen across the country right now. 
I first encountered Black Queer Studies when I was in my early 20s. I learned about the ways in which Black Queer Studies was a project of liberation for all people. These are some of the ideas that the college board saw fit to expunge. I first encountered the concept of intersectionality when I was a graduate student after reading Kim Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins. Learning about intersectionality allowed me to analyze and act on the multiple structures that produce racialized sexual harassment. The state of Florida wants to expunge the powerful tool and concept of intersectionality from the AP African American Studies course. In the 10th grade, I read a separate piece by John Knowles, and it was a total coming of age experience for me. And this feeling of connection removed my feelings of unworthiness, shame, and self-hatred. States are hoping to disappear this book now due to its homosexual themes. rebel, but a lot of the reasons that some think that it shouldn't be read by young people are the reasons that I think young people should go out and get this book. Zora Neale Hurston once wrote, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. So that is why I'm speaking up and that is why I'm asking you to speak up as well. Maya told the truth about childhood sexual abuse and by doing so, freed the multitudes to do the same. Books save lives. This is why we cannot ban I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Feminist theory from margin to center. Books like this, stories like this, ought to be taught. We cannot allow MAGA extremists to determine what authors we can read and what concepts we can study. We must demand the freedom to learn. So welcome, everyone. Let's start with the banned books. Um, I wanted to ask each of you, what was a banned book that transformed the way you think, that shaped your approach to life or the work that you do or the way you understand the world? Patrick, let's start with you. Thank you, Kimberly. There, there are way too many books uh, that have been banned that have impacted me and so many folks here, and some of it is... Uh, fiction like uh, Their Eyes Are Watching God, or it could be a book like uh, Dr. Manning Mirabel's uh, book, um, uh, How Capitalism Underdeveloped uh, Black America. But the one that I would lift up is Invisible Man by Raphael Ellison. And I think it's, it's exactly right for the conversation we're having tonight. There's a scene, Kimberly, in Invisible Man that, sh that transformed how I think about my history. Mm -hmm. It's a moment when the protagonist in the novel sees a black couple being evicted from their apartment in Harlem. Uh, and he sees them carrying these old bones that he recognizes as kind of knocking bones from the South, where you played, you played them in folk, in folk music. And he was embarrassed by that. Then he saw their free papers from Macon, Georgia. He felt nauseous. But then he says in the novel that he would rather bear that nausea of that history uh, like a rotting tooth than have it violently yanked out and eradicated because mm. there's something precious about that history. So what's happening right now is the yanking of that tooth in a, in a way that's doing a violence to all of our spirits. So Invisible Man is the book that I would lift up. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Janelle, what's one of yours? This is a, a tough one as well. And I do, I have to say, just thank you so much for inviting me to share this space. It's, it's such an honor. The book for me would have to be Parable of the Sower. Mm. Um, yes. I mean, Octavia Butler just killed that book and really laid out what I feel is happening slowly, 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 but surely. We're closer than we think. But more importantly, she introduced this idea of climate justice that I don't think is explored enough in our community. And it's incredibly essential that we start to have the conversations about how black and brown communities are more impacted by what's happening when we think about climate change. And that is a, an underlying part of that story that we really do need to sit in. And that shaped a lot of the work that I do. I don't think a lot of people know, but my role at the academy, I actually asked for more as if trying to um, shift a 95-year-old institution wasn't enough. I said, I want climate and I want climate activism and I want climate justice as a part of my job. So that, that's really been integral in my journey. Mm -hmm. 
Valerie. Um, <clears throat> the, the bluest eye saved my life. Um, I desperately wanted to be lighter and whiter because I associated that with respect and uh, dignity at the time. And mm. I wanted that so badly that I was like buying bleaching creams and bleaching my skin. And mm. I was like suicidal um, over that feeling. And I expressed this to a teacher one day and she was like, I'm going to bring you this book. Mm. And I saw that it was The Blue Aside by Toni Morrison. And I was like, I can't read this because I, I tried to read Beloved and I, I couldn't get through it because I didn't understand it. Mm. And I realized it was because I wasn't really ready to receive that message at the time. Mm. Um, but I had read The Bluest Eye and uh, like as soon as I had finished it, it was like 48 hours I finished the book and I had threw everything in the garbage and was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to start over. And I realized like... <laughs> For me, being black is a blessing. I'm, I'm going to be 41 years old mm. um, in a couple of, of weeks, God willing. And I look in the mirror and I'm like, people buy what I was born with. <laughs> so, and Toni Morrison helped me figure that out through the characters and through Pacola in particular. Mm. And just seeing that that was not how I wanted to end up. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> Books save lives. Reggie. Um, one of my great literary champions is a playwright. Um, the first black woman playwright to win a Pulitzer Prize. If you haven't figured out, Lorraine Hansberry. Um, her play, A Raisin in the Sun. Um, a year does not go by that I don't read that play the way that she merges humanity, social issues, and our history is an all-star for me. Mm. And so you're right, Patrick, there's so many. It's really hard to to choose. Um, I'll have to uh, also say the bluest eye. Um, I have to say that Toni Morrison um, brought so much, not only through her novels, uh, Sula, uh, Beloved, Paradise, but also from what we just heard, uh, her essays, Playing in the Dark, uh, that talks about racialization, how we exist for whiteness to exist. Um, she uh, obviously anticipated what was going to happen now, racism and fascism, uh, which we already heard. She is among the greatest writers of the 20th century and deserves to be in the pantheon of great writers, yet The Bluest Eye is the second most banned book in 2022, 2023. So her brilliance as a philosopher, a critic, a storyteller, I call her a conjurer, is what helps her pull the curtain back, letting us in on what she was trying to do and then doing it with breathtaking beauty. Let's be in conversation with her and one of her characters now. When I began writing The Bluest Eye, I was interested in the far more tragic and disabling consequences of accepting rejection as legitimate, as self-evident. The project then for this, my first book, was to enter the life of the one least likely to withstand such damaging forces because of youth, gender, and race. And 20 years later, I was still wondering about how one learns that. Who told her? Who made her feel that it was better to be a freak than what she was? Who had looked at her and found her so wanting, so small on, on a weight on the beauty scale? The novel pecks away at the gaze that condemned her. The reclamation of racial beauty in the 60s made me think about the necessity for the claim. 
Why, although reviled by others, could this beauty not be taken for granted within the community? Why did it need wide public articulation to exist? These are not clever questions, but in 1962, when I began this story, and in 1965, when this story began to be a book, the answers were not as obvious to me as they quickly became and are now. The assertion of racial beauty was not a re reaction to the self-mocking, humorous critique of cultural racial foibles common in all groups but against the damaging internalization of assumptions of immutable inferiority originating in an outside gaze. I focus therefore on how something as grotesque as the demonization of an entire race could take root inside the most delicate member of our society, a child the most vulnerable member, a female. In trying to dramatize the devastation that even casual racial contempt can cause, I chose a unique situation, not a representative one. I believe some aspects of her woundability lodged in all young girls. In exploring the social and domestic aggression that could cause a child to literally fall apart I mounted a series of rejections, some routine, some exceptional, some monstrous, all the while trying hard to avoid complicity in the demonization process Piccola was subjected to. Quiet as it's kept, there were no marigolds in the fall of 1941. We thought at the time that it was because Piccola was having her father's baby that the marigolds did not grow. A little examination and much less melancholy would have proved to us that our seeds were not the only ones that did not sprout. Nobody's did. Not even the gardens fronting the lake showed marigolds that year. But so deeply concerned were we with the health and safe delivery of Pecola's baby, we could think of nothing but our own magic. If we planted the seeds and said the right words over them, they would blossom and everything would be all right. It was a long time before my sister and I admitted to ourselves that no green was going to spring from our seeds. Once we knew our guilt was relieved only by fights and mutual accusations about who was to blame. For years, I thought my sister was right. It was my fault. I had planted them too far down in the earth. It never occurred to either of us that the earth itself might have been unyielding. We had dropped our seeds in our own little plot of black dirt just as Pecola's father had dropped his seeds in his own plot of black dirt. Our innocence and faith were no more productive than his lust or despair. What is clear now is that of all that hope, Fear, lust, love, and grief, nothing remains but Pecola and the unyielding earth. And Pecola is somewhere in that little brown house. She and her mother moved on to the edge of town, where you can see her even now, once in a while. The bird-like gestures are worn away to a mere picking and plucking her way between the tire rims and the sunflowers, between Coke bottles and milkweed, among the waste and beauty of the world, which is what she herself was. All of our waste, which we dumped on her and which she absorbed. And all of our beauty, which was hers first and which she gave to us, all of us, all who knew her, felt so wholesome after we cleaned ourselves on her. We were so beautiful when we stood aside her ugliness. Her simplicity decorated us. Her guilt sanctified us. Her pain made us glow with health. Her awkwardness made us think we had a sense of humor. Her, in her inarticulateness made us believe we were eloquent. Her poverty kept us generous. 
Even in her waking dreams, we used to silence our own nightmares. And she let us, and thereby deserved our contempt. We honed our egos on her, padded our characters with her frailty, and yawned in the fantasy of our strength. The novel tried to hit the raw nerve of racial self-contempt, expose it, and then soothe it. Not with narcotics, but with language that replicated the agency I discovered in my first experience of beauty. One problem was centering the weight of the novel's inquiry on so delicate and vulnerable a character could smash her and lead readers into the comfort of pitying her rather than into interrogation of themselves for the smashing. My solution breaks the narrative into parts that had to be reassembled by the reader. Seemed to me a good idea, the execution of which does not satisfy me now. Besides, it didn't work. Many readers remained touched but not moved. The other problem, of course, was language. Holding the despising glance while sabotaging it was difficult. Thinking back now on the problems expressive language presented to me, I am amazed by their currency, their tenacity. Hearing civilized language debase humans, watching cultural exorcisms debase literature, seeing oneself preserved in the amber of disqualifying metaphors. I can say that my narrative project is as difficult today as it was then. Mm. Thank you, Dominique and Vanessa. We could have a whole conversation about what we just heard. The, the brilliance of Toni Morrison in establishing the narrative, what she was trying to accomplish in doing that narrative. Um, this is what's being banned. What I want to ask um, is about uh, parallels. One of the reasons that this novel is being banned in the states that are banning it is that this story that she told, what she tried to mount to talk about the smashing of the, of, of the psyche of a young black girl is being banned because it's pornographic, it's sexually explicit, it's disturbing, it's offensive. What they're basically saying is what she was trying to do and the stories that she was trying to tell are too real to be told, too real to expose children to, too real to be part of the story of us. So I, I want to start with you, Janelle. Um, from your vantage point, in what ways does this justification for banning Toni Morrison uh, as being uncomfortable, as being too upsetting. How does this sensibility find expression or how is it echoed in Hollywood? Yeah, it's a great question. I think what's important in responding to this is to also reflect on the history of Hollywood. Hollywood has a long history of controlling narratives, right? You can call it censorship, but it's, it's no secret that a lot of the, the harmful stereotypes, tropes that have projected not only the black community, but Asian community, disability community, so many communities that sit on the margin of this industry have been harmed by some of the narratives that this industry has put out and has been widely consumed. So that's history. But what does that look like today? I'm, I'm a big fan and a big believer of celebrating our wins and celebrating progress. And at the same time, I still have to acknowledge that there are still barriers and controls to narratives in this industry. 
You can call it the green lighting process or the lack thereof. You can look at the access to funds to tell certain stories. We don't talk enough about the marketing of films, how they get out there in the world, who and what stories have access to marketing dollars to make sure they can be consumed, Mm -hmm. right? So that control, it still exists, whether we call it censorship or not. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about structural censorship on top of now legislative censorship. So um, it is it is building law on top of sensibilities that already are functioning in, in a way that suppresses the full story of us. Um, Valerie, I want to ask you, are there analogs to this process as uh, a journalist? Do you see similarities in the ways that certain stories can or cannot be told the the various structures of censorship that Janelle was just talking about? Um, The way that the sort of journalism structure is set up at the level that I'm at is, um, there's a lot of different steps. So one is, you know, a press release will come across my desk and then I have to ask, hey, is this good enough to publish? Pass. It's like, okay, you... Something about a black storyteller or a black yes, project. Right, or, or a something. black project that doesn't have anybody famous enough attached to it. Mm. It's like a pass. Um, this doesn't get views or whatever. There isn't anyone that will bring in readers. That's one way. Mm-hmm. Another way is um, the fact that there, are, there aren't that many of us, black women specifically, uh, at trades to handle the breadth of stories that come through. Um, We work a lot, and there are, I can count on one hand how many of of us are there at these places. So many stories come across our desk, and because a lot of what happens at trades is about the bottom line, um, time is money. Mm. And if something comes up that is that I think is important, but the news cycle has already moved on, the answer could possibly be no. Mm -hmm. Um, Or you may be too tired from all the work that you've already done to be able to work on something. A lot of stories require nuance. They require research. They require talking to people. And when you're only given 72 hours of time, that can't happen either. Right, right. Um, So we're talking about sort of the structure of censorship. So we're hearing about um, the process of green lighting and marketing. We're talking about what counts as news and what doesn't. And the fact that there's so few people who are actually covering that beat makes it all the more likely that certain ideas, certain stories are not going to get promoted. Um, Reggie. Um, I'm sure that there are plenty of people in the room who won't be surprised at anything that we've just heard. Um, There was a moment in 2020, promises were made. (laughs) Things were said. Um, Expectations may have been raised by that moment. Um, Now, maybe it was wishful thinking to think that a black man's death was actually going to fundamentally transform an industry um, that was grounded in in storytelling about black death. But um, you have been behind the scenes uh, in a lot of these conversations. So were we naive to think that 2020 was, you know, a fork in the road and we were going to find ourselves going down a different path? You don't want just a one-word answer, right? <laughs> you can give it that. You can drop the mic with it. <laughs> well, let me say, so, so George Floyd was murdered on May 25th. In that same week, um, maybe three days after that, that date, I got a notice from a studio that they were organizing a Zoom with hundreds of showrunners. Um, And yeah, there is a sense of optimism when I've never 
experienced anything like that. Mm-hmm. And so when I got on the Zoom, um, out of these hundreds of showrunners, there might have been at the most four of us who were black. Mm-hmm. That didn't rattle me from as long as I've been in the industry. And then it, it was revealed what the call was about. In the week of George Floyd's murder, the studio organized all of the showrunners to come together to talk about COVID and what we might think about getting shows back into production. Um, And so I was like, if I was optimistic, I ain't right now, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I got off the call and, you know, quickly, then it didn't become some action items. And um, I, I, I called the, the, the president of that studio, and folks were embarrassed. And I got together with Wanda Johnson, the, the, the mother of Oscar Grant, and some other folks. And we put together these panels to challenge storytellers, to challenge showrunners how to, to write about race. Um, I got together with some people in, in this room a sort of collective of black artists and lawyers and agents. It was a lot of us. Like what we were doing, the way we were coming together community-wise was historical. Mm -hmm. And we approached every studio and, I mean, geniuses in our industry Mm -hmm. to make fundamental change. And ultimately we got a shift, not a change, but a shift. So, um, but I would say most of us felt that it wasn't like we're in this moment where there was going to be fundamental change. There was a moment where we needed to seize the moment and make the changes we could get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so Patrick, I'm going to come to you to, to help us understand the, the, the bigger P politics of this, this move to so much suppression. Um, yes, I, I thought I was just talking about books tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the book of old pages being ripped out and playing them again and again and again. Um, just yesterday, you wrote a, a, a statement amplifying the threat uh, of a particular faction in our country that is all about suppression. It is about uh, creating a myth of one story and eliminating all other stories under the idea that these are damaging and discomforting and uh, divisive. So help us understand what we need to know uh, about censorship, about suppression, so that we can really see what's truly at stake in these assaults. Uh, surely some people will understand this in terms of employment and more jobs, and that, that's all true. But there's even more at stake with this level of censorship. What do we need to be worried about? I'm, I'm happy to help play a role in, in, in pulling back so that we can see the entire landscape in front of us, uh, Kimberly. But you know, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, what uh, my sister said here before about the historic role that Hollywood has played in our lives, particularly because it's important for us all to understand that the censorship is not what's really critical in this power game, in this power dynamic. The censorship has to be accompanied by myth-making, by a retelling of the story, right? It's not the censorship alone, it's the retelling. So if I think about the historic role that Hollywood has played in politics, I think about the very first movie screened in a White House in America, which was Birth Birth of of a a Nation, Nation. screened by whom? The architect of liberal institutions, Woodrow Wilson. And what did he say about that film? He said it was history written in lightning. It was important to understand at that moment that Woodrow Wilson was part of an intentional project of myth-making, romanticizing a past in order to suppress a growing movement in the country at that moment towards rights. Everything old is new again in America. It's the same moment now. And Kimberly, you are actually central to that rewriting and to the new mythology that they have to lift up. Why, why, why do I go there? So let's, let's look at what's happening with the book bannings. We need to understand that there is a Trojan horse of religion and morality that, has, that is being pushed 
uh, into every school board room, into every election fight, and, and behind that is the power of politics itself that's really emerging from that horse. So some years ago, some years ago, uh, this journalist named Chris Rufo, whose quotes were put up on the screen some time ago, uh, he was sitting in Seattle, uh, <laughs> and uh, there had been a, um, uh, a, a, a training, uh, anti-racism training in Seattle, and some employee of a company leaked the video to Chris Rufo. It was easy to caricature that video. Chris Rufo did something more than caricature it. He, instead, he started doing deep dive research on all the anti-racism training that was happening in that city at that time and realized that there were a number of scholars who were consistently coming up and being named in those trainings. He went into their footnotes and realized that this sister right here was part of the undergirding of the philosophy, and he was able to distort it, caricature it, and somehow tie it to Marxism. Same thing to Paul Robeson, Harry Belafonte, so many other folks. Why is this important? At the end of the day, we need to understand that there are hugely, deeply resourced political actors who have tremendous power that is being scaled and is being networked in the moment. Book banning is not a new thing in America. You know, the first real national book ban in this country was uh, against Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? But we've had so many book bannings since then. But usually book bannings are a retail business. They're not a wholesale business. Right now in this, in this state of Utah, uh, in Florida, in Texas, in Missouri, and uh, South Carolina, those are the five states where the vast majority of books are being banned. And if you go behind the Moms for Liberty and all these folks whose faces you're seeing on television, you will see money from the Koch brothers and a handful of other folks who are about the business of reclaiming the White House and trying to get a minoritarian power uh, in place in this country. Last thing I'll say as I pull back the lens here, we need to understand this moment is upon us because... There are some people who believe they are facing a demographic existential threat in this country. In 2010, the decennial census came out and projected by 2044, this would be a majority minority nation. That created a tremendous amount of insecurity, a sense of political dislocation for folks who understood that if they didn't make some moves in, in the immediate to destabilize the scholarship of Kimberly Crenshaw and others that were popular and had an appeal, not just to black folk, but to young folk in this country across the board. They didn't do something to, to discredit that. It would further dismantle their hold on power because of their sense of a demographic existentialism that is being copied in places like um, uh, Hungary by Viktor Orban, uh, Poland by Kaczynski, ten, um, uh, Turkey with Erdogan. I could go across the world and show you people who are absolutely positively mirroring the language of replacement theory that you're hearing in the U.S. and all these other places in the world because of demographic existentialism that they then tie to morality and religion in a way to break up our political power. And Kimberly yes. Crumshaw, you're kind of critical to this. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Uh, yeah, not not the best position to be in, I have to say. Um, and I, I'm I'm still not sure whether he really did all that research that he claimed no. he did. Uh, what one doesn't see any evidence of the capacity to understand ideas. But I digress. There there may, there may have I been digress. some plagiarism. <laughs> exactly. Um, but at the core of the of the effort to liberate America from what they call wokeness is uh, the idea of colorblindness, the idea that justice and fairness turns on repudiating. Uh, race consciousness in our storytelling, in, in our policy making, in our practices, uh, the idea that racism is individual, it's not structural. We can think our way out of it by not thinking about it at all. So piercing this myth is what Isabel Wilkerson invites us to do in CAST. America is an old house. We can never declare the work over. 
Wind, flood, drought, and human upheavals batter a structure that is already fighting whatever flaws were left unattended in the original foundation. When you live in an old house, you may not want to go into the basement after a storm to see what the rains have wrought. Choose not to look, however, at your own peril. The owner of an old house knows that whatever you are ignoring will never go away. Whatever is lurking will fester whether you choose to look or not. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction. I'll say that again. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction. Whatever you are wishing away will gnaw at you until you gather the courage to face what you would rather not see. We in the developed world are like homeowners who inherited a house on a piece of land that is beautiful on the outside, but whose soil is unstable, loam and rock, heaving and contracting over generations, cracks patched, but the deeper ruptures waved away for decades, centuries even. Many people may rightly say, I had nothing to do with all this, how all this started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. My ancestors, my ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaves. And yes, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have had nothing to do with it, but here we are. The current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bold walls and fissures built into the foundations. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars or joists, but they are ours to deal with now. When people live in an old house, they come to adjust to the idiosyncrasies and outright dangers skulking in an old structure. They put buckets under a wet ceiling, prop up groaning floors, learn to step over the rotting wood, tread in the staircase. The awkward becomes acceptable and the unacceptable becomes merely inconvenient. Live with it long enough and the unthinkable becomes normal. Exposed over the generations, we learn to believe that the incomprehensible is the way that life is supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali, for bringing those piercing words to life for us. And, and especially thank you for being here today, of all days. So thank you so much. So unaddressed, the ruptures and diagonal cracks will not fix themselves. So, you know, I want to come to you. One of the disciplines that aims to expose and fix these cracks is diversity, equity, and inclusion. But one of the most shocking stories to come out of Hollywood uh, amidst the backlash uh, to racial reckoning was six prominent black DEI executives lost, left their positions within six weeks, most of whom had been hired in 2020. You were one, and in a piece of rare candor, you wrote about some of the conditions. So talk to us a little bit about what's the lesson what should we infer? Why should we be so deeply concerned about what happened? Yeah, I think it's important to ground my response in being clear about what it means to be a practitioner of diversity work in these spaces. Because one of my favorite games to play, especially when I was at the academy, was to ask people what they thought my job was. <laughs> I could literally pull this room, y'all, and I feel like everyone would give me a different answer. And I love Jesus, but I am not the Messiah. <laughs> I was not entering this house, bringing the house back, to solve everything from racism to ableism to sex the list goes on. I alone cannot do that, right? 
But what I love about the house metaphor is when you hire a diversity professional, you are bringing them and giving them permission to enter your house and to open every single closet, every single door Mm -hmm. and explore the foundation of that house. And the crazy part is when I was hired, like so many of my colleagues who do this work, we were hired at a time when people didn't really understand why they were hiring us. They heard a lot of noise and they got a lot of pressure. We've got to hire a diversity professional. So you brought someone into your house without fully understanding and being clear as to why you wanted them and what you were expecting them to solve. So when I took my job, I opened every door. (laughs) And I think a lot of people don't really think, you think of the Academy, you think about the Oscars alone, right? It's also a film archive and a library. So I'm looking here questioning what stories are being preserved, what stories are being worthy of being preserved, Mm -hmm. and how do we put pressure on that as well? I'm looking at how do we create the first, you know, museum that centers on history and address, again, the harmful histories of film, but at the same time inspire that next generation to, to want to do more, to want to show up, right? And I am looking at the Oscars. I'm challenging the campaign regulations, the path to get the Oscars. I'm doing that, right? And one of the things I'm most proud of was the work around the inclusion standards for best picture consideration, which effectively said that in order to get that Oscar, in order to be eligible for Oscar consideration, a a film, a project had to demonstrate a true commitment to representation because an excellent film is an inclusive film. Mm. I think what was often misunderstood about that work... Yes. Thank you. What was often misunderstood about that work is here comes this institution and sometimes the institution became here comes Janelle Mm -hmm. telling us that we need to tell this specific story. I'm telling you what to say. The standards actually were not about controlling a specific story or narrative. But I remember very vividly sitting in a room of very well-respected producers whose work I personally admire and love. And, and one of the topics was the inclusion standards. We have to solve this. They're out in the world. Everyone's challenging this. We got to pull back. What if we just create a separate award for diversity? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. And I'm sitting there thinking, mm. wow, are we now introducing separate but equal again? Mm. <laughs> And y'all, this is, I think, what is is so important to understand about so many individuals, not only myself, but so many individuals who are stepping into this work. You are stepping into this work because you care, because your values drive you to show up, not because you feel safe, not because you feel protected, because in these roles, you are often the recipient of some of the most hateful, harmful, challenging conversations, but you show up. And you show up and you get exhausted. Mm. So I want to remind all of us that in order for these roles and for these individuals to be successful and to be effective, it requires everyone in this room to make sure that happens. And that means supporting, uplifting, not necessarily questioning the strategy, but but trusting because this work isn't easy and it's not about us. It's about y'all. And it always has been. Thank you for opening the door and showing us a little bit of what's behind it. Uh, Valerie, one of the things that we have learned about this war on woke is the way that the media sometimes have helped to enable it. Um, We've seen in mainstream media, whenever there's an attack on a set of ideas in a book, however outrageous it is, the media then think, okay, we have to cover it because there's two sides to every story. Very little interrogation of what actually is at stake. Very little investment in basically the values of of free expression. I'm curious about what was the response in entertainment media after this moment where all of these DEI professionals um, uh, left their jobs. Was there any real serious commitment to reporting on it, interrogating, trying to figure out what is this about? What's happening? What are the conditions? What ways, being inside, have you seen this being enabled? Um, often what I see with, with, 
stories of diversity and and things of that nature. Um, again, the news cycle moves so fast, and it's like, well, if you haven't gotten that out in seventy two hours, or they'll come they'll come to you and say, hey, can you process this? It's like, so you want me to examine the entire history of DI in Hollywood and get that out in in twenty four hours? <laughs> um, when I have four and five other things to do and I'm already exhausted, okay, I'll give it a try. Not moving fast enough, we've moved on. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one way in which those get centered, but there's also not enough effort put into investigating further. Now, Deadline has has made efforts in wanting to uh, investigate further, but then I have to ask myself, do I have the bandwidth for that? And then I get into this, Thing where I go back and forth of feeling bad about not having the energy to go forward. And so there, there needs to be an investment, not only in the stories, but in the people who can tell them. There are four of us at trades, but there are other people who write and there are other people who write well. It's okay to seek them out too. There doesn't just have to be one of us everywhere. I cannot be the harbinger of every black story that comes across my desk. That's not fair to other black people. And I don't see how that's fair to me if I can't tell the best story or investigate it the best way that it deserves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're you're giving us, you're giving us the uh, line and verse of, of how suppression of the story of us happens through the structures that are set up, the priorities that, that are pursued and those that are not. So we're, we're seeing echoes of, of the same story. A few minutes ago, Patrick, I said, yes, we, we, we are talking about books. We're talking about pages out of an old book. One of the old books is uh, you maintain control, you maintain um, a, a narrow uh, democracy by depriving people of liter- literacy, by saying when people have become uh, vocal and articulate and demanding about the kind of transformation that's necessary, they're then called dangerous. They're then called, they're then called un-American. And so we see some of these pages being ripped out now. Toni Morrison, the other thing that they say about the bluest eye is that it's a socialist communist text, right? So why does this keep working, right? They did it to, to Martin. They did it to Malcolm. They're, they're doing it to Tony. We can go back further in history and find all of the moments where black knowledge and, and advocacy has dis, been, been dismissed. And here's, here's the kicker. Just this week, Charlie Kirk um, said that um, Dr. King was actually an awful, not a good person that the Civil Rights Act was a huge mistake. Now, this stuff sounds like it's, it's really, you know, far, far right stuff. But we've seen far, far right stuff come to the center of American politics. Tell us why this keeps happening and what can be done about it. Kimberly, I'm going to be really honest right now. I'm having a tough time emotionally. It was really hard listening to Janelle describe the experience that she had uh, in the industry in that one particular uh, company uh, and her sense of loneliness and isolation. I want to tell her first that she's not alone, that we're all standing with her this moment and into the future. I had um, had the privilege of working in the White House for the first black president of the United States. Uh, I served as the first black man to be appointed the White House political director, and I will tell you Every single day, it was the loneliest place uh, in America uh, to be with all the slings and arrows that were coming from us. Uh, but uh, every now and then, I remember, I remember this experience, and I'm saying, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm saying this just to hold on to. I remember one of the toughest days that we ever had uh, in that White House when we had the Tea Party blowing up on us and all the racist tropes and some tough stuff going on in the economy. I remember trailing behind the president as he was walking into the Oval Office and he was running his hands along the wall. Uh, and without looking back at me and the rest of the senior staff, he said, you know, um, these walls were built by slave hands. He didn't have to say anything else to us. He, it was his way of saying, our folk have been through harder things than this. We're going to figure this out. So we're going to figure this out with you. 
please know that. Um, mm. So, you know what, Kimberly, Ki Ki Kimberly, it keeps working because we don't have agency. <laughs> Mm. That's why it keeps working. They, they tell the same story uh, and lift up the same caricatures all the time. Let us not underestimate the power in this country, in this capitalist society, of the specter of socialism and Marxism that is always, always stuck on our foreheads. It's happened to you. You had Paul Robeson up there before. You had Harry Belafonte before. You know, Harry Belafonte is somebody who... Uh, when he lit, he was he was a personal friend and a mentor of mine. Never got the Congressional Medal of Freedom, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, despite all of his accomplishments. Far lesser celebrities have yes. received those awards. But it's and you know I'm telling you this openly in front of cameras. I was in meetings in the White House where we were vetting whether or not Harry Belafonte should receive that award, and folks were able to come to the room to say, well, you know, he said things that you know he 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 supported Fidel Castro. Could be a could be a Marxist can't give him that award. These same stories, these same tropes keep working because we don't own the agency of storytelling. We are actually not the architects of the narrative. There is a constant erasure that happens generation to generation of the narrative that, you know, was built with blood, sweat, uh, and, uh, and tears. And I think it will continue to work until we recognize the absolute power of network. Right? We can't come into this conversation in our individual siloed seats and walk away as individuals and not feel some sense of collective obligation to the challenges that we have uh, in front of us and the opportunity that's in front of us. Understand this. Understand this. They would not be lifting these same tropes, making these same arguments, and making these attacks against the folks that you hear, have on stage here and in this industry if not for our success. Toni Morrison is being attacked because Toni Morrison is powerful, right? Who's, who's the most banned writer in history? William Shakespeare. I think people are going to be reading Toni Morrison 500 years from now, but we've got to make sure that we attach that cultural... I always think that politics is downstream of culture. We have to attach that powerful cultural narrative that you heard being recited here to an immediate and proximate political opportunity that's in front of us that I hope to be able to say just a little bit more about it towards the end. Absolutely. Um, so, so, so Reggie, we, we're, we're about to, to sit with a minute for, for a minute in your effort to uh, bring back into public discourse um, Malcolm and Martin and their relationship with one another. Um, I, partly, I want to know what was the inspiration for doing it, but more importantly, I want to know what were the kind of moments that you had to um, navigate in, in being able to, to, to bring this story forward? We've been talking about various modalities of, of censoring, various ways in which we have to uh, shrink the story or make sure that the story fits within the available spaces. And I can't imagine telling this story didn't require you to have to figure that out. So what can you tell us about what went on behind the scenes? Behind the scenes. Well, well, first of all, I just want to say, as, as you know, Patrick referenced Birth of a Nation, the other thing that happened when Birth of a Nation came out in 1915, the lynchings across the country rose. And so if you understand that, then you understand what we do and images and what we put out impact behavior. Um, we were first approached, um, Gina and I, when I say we, we were approached uh, asked if we wanted to do a narrative about Dr. King. And, and, and we were wrestling with it. And, and I said to Gina, you know, we don't get to have Dr. King without Malcolm X. And we said, you know what, let's live with that. And, and we pitched it in that way. And when you really have an understanding that there is... Um, you know, a, a lot of unfairness and censorship within our stories. One of the things that really becomes important, sometimes you got to get a win. And so sometimes to get this win, just from an artist standpoint, you have to have clarity of vision. And so um, we presented a very clear vision. It's the first time that we actually 
pre presented a vision of something we weren't going to write ourselves, and so we put a, a, a great team together to do it. Um, yeah, we would have loved to have had more than eight, but be able to challenge perspectives, to be able to at this time and you know, in a climate that talks about make America great and everything. That you, I mean, these guys, we talk about January 6th, Malcolm and Martin, they were at the Capitol fighting for the Civil Rights Bill, you know? And so we just felt that there's a way to do this, not as a museum piece, not to say that this story was in the past and is not relevant now, but rather to say it's more relevant now than ever. And, and that's why we had to get this win. So let's take a look at the win and then hear the words of these two giants. Reverend. Master. We meet at last. We have been oppressed. We are forced to ride the back of a bus so a white passenger could see. Innocent black men are in prison. How many more have to be slain for America to say enough is enough? We're in this together. How can I help you? We will lead people to real equality in this country fight against oppression by any means necessary. What you're doing is just. Never question that. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? I believe you're going to do great things. We must be a little daring. We can change the course of history. Be careful. Evil looms over everything. This is our reality now. think this is going to hurt more, you or me? I imagine it's unlikely to hate either one of us. Well, then let's keep them guessing. Ain't mad at that. <sighs> While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. One of the basic points in your statement is that our acts are untimely. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed. According to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost meant never. We have waited for more than 340 years for our God given and, un and constitutional rights. <sighs> I guess it is easy for those who have never felt this, the stinging darts of segregation to say wait. 
But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an influent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stands, never knowing what to expect next and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Words from Malcolm X's The Ballet or the Bullet. We must, we must understand the politics of our community and we must know what politics is supposed to produce. And until we become politically mature, we will always be misled, led astray, or deceived or maneuvered into supporting someone politically who doesn't have the good of our community at heart. Once you change your philosophy, you change your thought pattern. Once you change your thought pattern, you change your attitude. Once you change your attitude, it changes your behavior pattern. And then you go on into some action. As long as you got a sit-down philosophy, you have a sit-down thought pattern. And as long as you think that old sit-down thought, you'll be in some kind of sit-down action. They'll have you sitting in everywhere. Well, you and I have been sitting long enough. And it's time for us today to start doing some standing and some fighting to back that up. So today our people are disillusioned. They've become disenchanted. They've become dissatisfied. And in their frustrations, they want action. And I'm here to tell you, in case you don't know it, that you've got a new, you've got a new generation of black people in this country who don't care anything whatsoever about odds. They don't want to hear you all, Uncle Tom, handkerchief heads, talking about the odds, no. This is a new generation. When we open our eyes today and look around America, we see America not through the eyes of someone who has enjoyed the fruits of Americanism. We see America through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of Americanism. We, see, we don't see any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. We haven't benefited from America's democracy. We've only suffered from America's hypocrisy. Oh, I say you have been misled. You've been had. You've been took. I know you don't like me saying that. Well, I'm not the kind of person who's come here to say what you like. I'm going to tell you the truth. And the generation that's coming up now can see it. And I'm not afraid to say it. 22 million 
black victims of Americanism are waking up and they are gaining a new political consciousness, becoming politically mature. And as they become, develop this political maturity, they're able to see we're in a position to determine who will go to the White House and who will stay in the doghouse. You are the one that has that power. When you see this, you can see that the Negro vote is the key factor. And despite the fact that you are in a position to be the determining factor, what do you get out of it? And this is why I say it's the ballot or the bullet. It's liberty or it's death. It's freedom for everybody or freedom for nobody. So Martin and Malcolm's words continue over the years to stir us emotionally, stir us politically, but most importantly, stir us to action. So Reggie, I want to start with you. Is there words still ring in our ears? What kind of partnerships, what kind of actions, what kind of new connections does this conversation, this new reality make our imperative to do together? What are you doing? I'm so excited to, to, to answer that question. That's really why I wanted to be here. Um, first, I just want to, you know, I, I believe in giving credit where, where, where credit's due, and I credit Nat Geo for embracing the vision that Gene and I had for this series, and very, very happy we're able to get it made. Um, during the strike, um, organically, black showrunners started fellowshipping. Um, one of the first people that I started to talk to about what was going on in the industry from a black writer, from a black showrunner point of view is and Catchy Carol. I saw you sneak in, so what's up, Catch? Um, and so black showrunners started to get together. We would meet once a week. Now people back to work, we're sort of meeting once a month. But our aim is to support each other, to lift each other up, to sometimes we talk about raising kids, sometimes we talk about the industry, but to remind each other that we're not alone. Now, in this, in, um, in, in sort of what we've been doing, we decided let's meet with Kimberly Crenshaw and various other leaders in our community. And Kim, you came and you spoke with us and it was very enlightening. And, and out of those conversations, we decided we as black showrunners, as leaders in our industry, need to do something about the banned books. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to present an initiative from the Black Showrunner Collective that I'm inviting all of you to participate in. So do you understand a little bit of the history? De two, over two decades ago, people who were accept, upset about cigarettes wanted Hollywood to um, do something about it, not have characters smoking cigarettes. And so nowadays, even still, if you have a character smoking a cigarette, Standards and practices will give that writer a note. They'll say, hey, don't have your character smoke cigarettes. So what if we flip that? What if we say we need to normalize what should be normal? Have your production designer put a banned book on a shelf, on a kitchen counter, on a desktop. If you have a scene in a park, have somebody on a park bench reading a banned book. Let's free our books, y'all. If you, if you have a character going to school, have him or her, have them place a banned book in their backpack. It never even needs to be a major part of the storytelling because it should be organic into our lives. So we have about 20 black showrunners already doing it. We're inviting the rest of the artistic community to get on board. Hashtag free our books and let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. I love that. 
<laughs> All right, uh, and, 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 and quick add-ons. Uh, Valerie, Janelle, Patrick, this is all about we understand what the situation is, we understand what's at stake, we got an idea on the table, something concrete we can do. What do you want to add to it? What needs to happen and who needs to do it? Valerie. Um, <sighs> this is something that I think everybody needs to do. It's something that the media can do, even in just the ads that they put up on the site. Uh, they put up ads for, from Barnes and Noble that have pictures of different books. Why can't it be one of the banned books? It should be one of the banned books, and it should be things that people see, no matter what article they may be reading on a website, there should be something, a prompt or something that just pops up and says, all boys aren't blue or beloved or something like that at Barnes & Noble, at wherever. And I think that that's um, really important because the media has proven how it is very ad-driven. Why can't this be a part of that? Exactly. And, and let's, just re let's just remember that booksellers need to be behind these campaigns. I don't know where they are, but they need to be behind them because basically they're the ones that are selling the books, right? So it makes no sense why we don't have Barnes and Nobles and uh, Amazon and Audible and everybody else getting behind unbanning books. Do you know what, what should we be doing? Yeah, I, I'm, despite my monologue, y'all, I am full of optimism and hope in a way that I, I, I'm like, literally like, wow, where did this come from? But a big part of it is because I choose to sit in our wins and celebrate our progress. And we need to do more of that. Uplift the work that we are proud of as a community and not even the work on its own. But when I sit here and think about Origin, yes, it's an incredible and beautiful film, but I admire how it was made, how it was funded. That that is innovation. I admire what David Oyelowo and Nate Parker are building with the launch of Mansa, a new streaming platform for black stories. I am celebrating those wins. And for our continued progress in this industry, we all need to show up and talk about the wins, show up and celebrate, show up and support, and truly invest in, in our stories in a very big way. And Patrick, thank you, Janelle. You have the final word particularly in this year, what is it that we need to take out of this place right here in order to move this agenda of unfreeing, what, freeing our books? One, one word, Kimberly, accountability. We're having a wonderful conversation here tonight. Some powerful things have been said on this stage. Sundance comes and goes, but once a year, during the course of this entire year, the entire nation is pausing to reflect look back on itself and think forward into the future. We have to make certain that we inject some measure of this conversation about censorship, about the banning of our stories, about erasure into public debate and discourse. People are running in all of your communities, in all of your states. You all are powerful holders of narrative. You're gonna be asked to be surrogates. You're gonna be asked to make videos. You're gonna be asked to help people promote their own brand and I hope as suggestions have been made here about lifting up some of the banned books, we push and interrogate and ask questions. And I hope, in addition to accountability, we'll take up the notion of the power of network. All of us should be back together next year in Sundance, but not on a performative stage like this, but in a circle with one another saying, all right, so what did we do in Utah, in Florida, in Missouri, in Texas? to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice. Dr. King may have been right about that notion, but we have to impose our will on it. Last I'll say is, as to quote Toni Morrison, this is precisely the moment when artists go to work. We write, we do language, this is how civilizations heal. That's your obligation. All right, thank you, thank you Padraig. So look, I, I just want to affirm, particularly this last point, there's so much you can do um, at the local level. These book bans, this effort to suppress and erase our knowledge, it's happening locally. And a lot of us don't get involved in local politics. Leave no power on the table.
When you don't, when you don't get involved, when you don't go to these school board meetings, when you don't ask if there are any books being banned in your your kids' school, when you're not part of this, you are conceding the terrain to those who are trying to erase our history. So we have to get involved in every way possible. Amplify, free the books. Amplify, free our books, amplify uh, uh, freedom to learn, books unbanned. Join us in May for our day of action. Follow us at AAPF. Start your own banned book club in your community and importantly with your allies. Help people be, uncom be comfortable with discomfort. That is what's driving this. This is, this is what's creating the framework. Learning, education, making ourselves better, that involves discomfort. Discomfort is the predicate for learning. So let's not give in to the fear of discomfort. And let's also remember, Dr. King wrote, um, there, there is no problem with creative tension. The, the problem is not allowing ourselves to rise to the occasion to meet it, to learn and to grow. So as we're about to move into our dance party portion of the evening, and that is as important as everything we've been doing, let's think about how to continue to build these purposeful, lasting connections. Now, um, uh, we've got stuff set up across the room. If you're moved by this conversation, come uh, make your comment so that we can tell the world that we're not going to accept banned books anymore. Um, if you want to learn more about CRT, listen this this spring uh, for our limited edition Intersectionality Matters primer on critical race theory, uh, Intersectionality Matters with Kimberly Crenshaw. That's my own little plug. Um, so I've got to thank people before we can get on with the party. Of course, I have many thank yous. First to my panelists, Patrick, Janelle, Reggie, and Valerie for this invigorating conversation. A special thank you to our artists, Gina, Kelvin, Aaron, Anjanu, Dominique, and Vanessa. Thank you to Reggie and his whole team of the Black Showrunners uh, Collective for being thoughtful and dynamic collaborators. Also, a special thanks to our, sp our sponsors, New York Women's Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, the Peggy and Jack Baskin Foundation, H&M, Nat Geo, Imagine Entertainment, Art Equity, Black Hollywood Education, and Resource Center. Thanks to Joanna Vicente, CEO of the Sundance Institute and all of her team. And of course, to my team, my wonderful team at AAPF, friends and family for bringing this dream to life and to all of you. Y'all came out at 8.30 for a panel, so we feel like we got to give you a party. And now to close us out with our marching orders, Gina Loring, take us home. This is an original poem called Continuum. There is a through line, a blueprint map. Step back. Watch how the pattern comes into focus, how the compass always points the same way. Nothing is new, nothing is now. Nothing is new, nothing is now. Everything is right on track, right where they would have it at. Sunset to sunrise, chain gangs and field cries. Nothing is new, nothing is now. Nothing is new, nothing is now. Nothing is new, nothing is now. A broken record spinning backwards, then forwards, then backwards again. Strange fruits swaying in the wind. Connect the dots, the lines between each spot. Change the language, the laws, the reason, the cause. But hear that echo boomerang back, always back. One step forward, then always back. Let us unpack, crack the code. You know the one. The system in place so long, we forgot it exists. But this is not fiction, not an anecdote. Just a few decades ago, my grandmother marched for the right to vote. Black and woman means you are a miracle. Resilient just by claiming your space on this earth. As if all of humanity was not traced back to our wombs. As if we didn't do the math calculations that sent the first man to the moon. As if our brethren didn't invent the traffic light, microphones, open heart surgery. As if an enslaved man didn't introduce vaccinations to the Western world through his memory of African medicine. As if Big Pharma didn't concoct copies of herbs and roots from the rainforest of the Amazon, Puerto Rico, the Congo. As if Egypt wasn't the cradle of civilization. 
the birthplace of mathematics, science, astronomy, as if the Aztecs weren't masterful architects, studied the sun, made the first solar calendar, as if the indigenous tribes of the Americas, Canada and Polynesia and Australia, the first nations who populated the planet long before the concept of colonization, respected the elements, the stars, studied the seasons, farmed the land, the original agricultural scientists, built entire infrastructures and languages beyond your comprehension, hieroglyphics, Sanskrit, Swahili. We were griots long before your history books, the fairy tales you call facts. Listen, Jack. <laughs> Everything you know, or think you know, comes from the people you seek to silence. You cannot withhold something that does not belong to you. You can't tie up the wind, make the ocean bow at your feet. The stories you teach are full of half-truths, trains with no tracks. You have selective memory, so today, let's recap the myriad ways you have weaponized education. One, 1740 to 1867. Literacy is illegal for all enslaved people, punishable by death. Two, 1864 to 1877. Over 631, 631 black schoolhouses burnt to the ground during Reconstruction. Three, 1877 to 1964. Segregated schools in Jim Crow America, separate and unequal. Four, 1926 to present day. Standardized testing designed to resegregate, favor in or filter out. Five, 2022. The Stop Woke Act prohibits school curriculum from teaching accurate history, followed by the College Board's removal of cultural pedagogy from AP courses. Six, 2023. Affirmative action dismantled by the Supreme Court, which is comprised of six descendants of Europe, two women of color, and one self-loathing snake. None of this is a mistake. It is by design. It is by design. It is by design. Engineered by sick minds seeking control over what belongs only to God. Nothing is new, nothing is now, nothing is new, nothing is now, nothing is new, nothing is, new, is now. The definition of a pattern is a repeated form or design. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting new results. Nothing is new, nothing is now. There will always be the next wave. It is the ebb and flow. We know this is a marathon, not a sprint. The storm will always pass over. The storm will always pass over. There is no amount of unjust legislation, force limitation, tantrums in the form of violence. Even with every disadvantage, we persevere generation after generation, generation after generation. Good Lord, generation after generation. This battle is not black or white. It is right or wrong. So we thrive and resist and we pass the baton. Thank you. Much love.